My name is Alan Edward Herbert Gray. You're a Herbert. I am a Herbert. <laughs> no, I'm not. I'm a Herbert. <laughs> I always used to get into trouble for popping the fuchsia buds. Oh yes, every child loves doing that. <laughs> I remember my father bedding out um, lots of salpiglottis, which is a petunia type um, annual, and he took all the big plants and he left me with about three squinny little runts, you see. And I stamped my foot, I still do it today, by the way. I stamped my foot and I, <laughs> I said, why have I got to have the second best? Why can't I have the biggest? Hello, welcome to the second episode of Get Gardening's new podcast for plant lovers called Talking Dirty. Um, we already had our first episode where we did all the introductions. I'm Thordis Fridrikson at my home in Cambridge. Alan Gray is um, at his... No, you haven't done it properly. You got to do the full, the full name. <laughs> Come on. Okay. I'm Thordis Marie Sophia Fridrikson at my home in Cambridge. Alan Gray, or sorry, Alan Edward Herbert Gray. <laughs> That's right, named after both grandfathers. Herbert the horticulturalist, as we're now calling him, is yeah. at his home at his trust and old vicarage. How are you, my dear chap? I'm very well, thank you. How are you? Yeah, you look warm. absolutely fine, actually. I'm very warm. It's very close and I've got a light on me, so I'm very hot. So apologies if I, you know, glow over the next I'm few minutes. I'm in the office with the windows open, the curtains blowing in the gentle breeze. It's lovely. Oh, I should have opened a window. Anyway, as everyone can see, uh, or, or possibly, you know, if you're listening to this, you can't see it, but there is a mystery extra person on this podcast, our first guest. So shall we do a big reveal, Alan? I think we'd better see who's behind those screens. Uh, on my cue, reveal. There we go. <laughs> it is our other Get Gardening co-conspirator, the plant doctor himself, Ian Roof. Greetings, so, greetings, lovely people. Ian. Can you have your full, we have your full name, please? Oh, it's just Ian Scott Roof. Nothing as grand, nothing double barreled nothing historic or floral, just Ian Scott. I'm sure we can come up with a fun nickname around Scott, but we'll, we'll work on that. Um, Ian. Ian, can I just say it should be Ian Scott Chopper Roof? Oh, very nice. Well, that'll keep the ladies happy. <laughs> Ian is definitely not afraid to cut a plant hard back, something we'll undoubtedly hear more about uh, in coming episodes. But we've done all our introductions, Ian. Tell us a bit about yourself. Oh, well, um, I've been gardening for a very long time. Um, I started serving broad beans with my father when I was about three or four and started actually veg growing first because that was a thing we did at weekends. Um, and then I really just got into it after that. I mean, I just fell in love with plants. I love growing things. I love reading about them. And I've always stood by my mantra that the best way to learn about a plant is to grow it, which isn't so easy now because I've got quite a small garden but I do tend to indulge my plant passion by helping out at Alan's garden when I can and obviously you know I used to do talks and things for gardening groups and used to be involved with lots of uh, other things like that not so much now but um, I'm busy being a freelance horticulturalist and looking after between 15 and 20 gardens um, and it's lovely I wouldn't change it for the world. No wonder it's so hard to find a free moment in, uh, mm. in your life. Lots of, lots of gardens, lots of gardens. So busy. So what have you been up to, you know, over the last week? What would be a good way of kind of summarising some of your gardening activities? Hedges. That'd be a really good way of summing up my week. So lots of hedging, um, lots of yew, lots of hornbeam, um, a bit of beech, a bit of purple beech for one of my clients as well. And we've just finished doing the box as well, all the box hedging in, in one of our gardens. Um, as you know, we do bits for Alan, so we've still got quite a bit to do there, but we're on with that at the moment. Bit of grass cutting. Uh, we've been cutting some formal lawns, been cutting through some meadows um, and planning as well. I'm always planning ahead. I'm now planning for the autumn. So I'm planning for new projects to start in clients' gardens. So we're looking at taking out some large overgrown trees and adding in some new interesting plants. So I'm going to put a nice um, cathedral of white beech in, which will be quite nice. So that'll be lovely. Um, and then just radiate things out from that and see what happens. So, yeah, quite a mixed week. I've done a bit of sitting in the garden as well at home in my own garden. I've had the odd cup of tea. I know the grey won't believe it, but I have. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Alan said that one of his absolute favourite jobs was planning uh, any kind of planting combination, any border. Uh, is it the same for you? 
Oh, it's lovely. It's one of the most exciting things to do is to sort of redevelop um, an old area, for example, maybe some old planting that's gone over or just to plant something new. It's lovely. And one of the best things about it is, is, is choosing the plants and be able to try and grow new and interesting things. Talking of plants, I think you have come to this podcast with a bit of show and tell. Well, I thought... Oh, there we are. Hello. There we are. I thought that I couldn't not have some plants. I'm in the office and there's no plants in the office. So um, I was at the folks this morning for a coffee um, and I thought I'd cut a few bits. So I've got some roses in here. I've got some lovely um, hosta flowers from a lovely hosta called Praying Hands, which is lovely. I've got some salvias in here, some salvia Jezebel, which is a well-known variety. Um, some agastache, some lovely agastache from Mexico, which is also very good. And a couple of really good fuchsias. I'm a big fan of fuchsias. So just fuchsia ricatoniae in here, which is lovely. And this one here is really nice. I got this from Wales a few years ago and it's called Chilliton Beauty. And it's absolutely lovely. It's a great hardy fuchsia. It really is fantastic. So I thought, well, at least I can show you a few flowers and the scent from these roses oh it's absolutely fantastic <laughs> when i'm out on my dog walk uh, people must think i'm mad i'm forever stopping and sniffing roses not so many sweet peas in my own garden i'm always sniffing sweet peas but um out on roses uh, out on walks people will, i think often see me stopping and <sighs> just taking in that amazing scent so so divine i mean fuchsias alan we talked about fuchsias a lot um on a, the last episode we did indeed, but I've just written down Chilliton Beauty because it is a very good future that Ian just showed us and I have had it. Unfortunately, I don't have it anymore. I don't know why, probably carelessness, um, but I, I, I don't have it anymore, but I'm going to get that again. Um, it's Yes, fuchsias, I mean, fuchsias do so well, providing you don't get capsid bugs in your garden because capsid bugs, they nibble away at the emerging shoots and they also pinch the flower buds and they eat the flower buds. So. Um, Often you have to wait, if you get capsid bugs, they're difficult to deal with. You have to wait until September when their life cycle is completed. Um, and then, you know, your fuchsias flower and flower and flower. And of course, with our autumns being so benign now, the fuchsias can go on flowering. Well, in actual fact, if I, I mean, Ian will know this. We had a lovely little diminutive fuchsia flowering here when we had our snowdrop day and everyone was looking at it. Can you it was lovely, it? yeah. It was one of the thymophilia ones. It was a really nice, sort of quite a, a bright, um, exotic pink, wasn't it? And it was actually in a north yes. border around the north side of your house and it was flowering beautifully and it's lovely. I think probably one of the ones that people might know is Lottie Hobby is one of those sort of what I call the thymophilia ones, one of the very small leafed sort of, well, they're pretty hardy now really, aren't they? Providing they get some yeah. good winter drainage. Yeah. I couldn't tell you the names of them, but I have two, um, both from Richard Hobbs, the brilliant botanist uh, who we all know and love dearly. Um, I have two on my patio and I must confess, despite, you know, having loved gardening for years um, and learnt loads from you two in particular over the years, I don't think I'd ever heard of this particular kind of diminutive fuchsia until, I don't know, two years ago or something. <laughs> Oh, well, that's Magellanica pumilla, which is one that he loves to grow, which is a little tiny dwarf um, Magellanica type, like I showed you uh, in, the, in the vase here. And it really is so well behaved. It's a lovely little thing. It really is. It'd be good for a trough then. It'd be brilliant for a trough, actually. You could add it to an alpine trough, for example, to give you some, some late summer, early autumn colour. I think it's a lovely little thing. I think probably no more than about sort of um, 15 to 25 centimetres. That's its sort of maximum height. It really is a sweet thing. The only, yeah, you're right with the trough. The thing about it is I, I got it. And even though I have a really small garden, I didn't want to lose it in the, the midst of all the other plants. And in some respects, having a small garden, you cram things in and it's so easy to lose plants because they just get outcompeted by others. So it, that's why they're on my patio in, in specific pots so that I can make sure I look after them and don't swamp them out I, with other plants. I always give them a title. Uh, these are plants that, I mean, I always remember this, you see, from Sandringham House years and years ago when the late, her late Majesty Queen Elizabeth Queen Mother was alive and her and Princess Margaret used to take a boat trip to go and see Edward Seagull at Ludham. Um, <laughs> and he was an artist, famous artist, and he painted broad scenes. And they took a whole load of pictures back to Sandringham and they were stood up against the panelling in one of the rooms there. And the Queen Mother said, yes, we're, we're awaiting consideration. <laughs> that's, what my, that's what my plants in pots are. They are waiting consideration. <laughs> <laughs> well, they're often considered, to be honest. 
people listening to this uh, may well be putting uh, that that tiny diminutive uh, fuchsia to the top of their wish list. Which brings me to something I would like to introduce to our podcast, and that is a feature called floral FOMO, fear of missing out. The plants that you don't have in your life, maybe you've seen them on social media, in a garden you visited, uh, in a magazine, and you wish you had them, but you don't yet. And I wondered if either of you guys had any floral FOMO to share? Okay, well, there's a lot of floral FOMO in my life, but like I said, having a small garden, then, you know, I can't put much in, but it just comes from reading a really good article in a latest issue of a magazine that's come through, and it's um, Nicotiana mutabilis, and I don't know why I've not grown it before. Uh, we all know Nicotiana alata and forms that we have for bedding and bedding schemes, and you'll know Nicotiana sylvestris, which is the huge, long, white trumpeted tobacco plant, which is fragrant, but mutabilis, I don't know why I've not grown it before, grows to anything up to five feet in the border, strong stems, but a sort of open wiry habit, nice cluster of leaves at the bottom, and then wonderful flowers, which obviously, as the name suggests, mutate, hence mutabilis, but through pinks and whites and creams and just the most lovely thing. And I, it's something I'm really going to try and grow because my mantra in this small garden is that nature doesn't leave any spaces. If there's a space in the soil, nature will fill it. And that's my gardening mantra is that if I've got a space, put a plant in it. And so I'm thinking that some Nicotiana metabolis might be something nice just to add, just to give a bit of airy height above all the planting that I've got. So that's my floral FOMO. Uh, and that's what I'm definitely going to be trying next year. <laughs> what about you, Mr. Gray? Well, I don't know whether mine's a bit of a cheat, but it, but it, it, it was a, uh, it was a, uh, what do you call this little bit? Floral FOMO. Floral FOMO. Well, it was a floral FOMO until today. And the funny thing is, incidentally, and there's some plants here for you, you know what I'm going to say. Um, it, this was a floral FOMO until today because Graham and I were looking at plants during the week and he said to me, do you think we should try the cabbage tree in our garden? It's very borderline hardy. Um, and it's a, it's an exotic, obviously, and it has sort of, sort of kind of strange orangey flowers on it. And it's, it's, it's a big leaf plant and it's called Grandoceris littoralis. Um, have you heard of it, Ian? No, never. This sounds wonderful. Keep going. Well, <laughs> well, the strange thing is that Richard and Lizzie arrived today with some plants from um, slightly north of here. OK. Um, the plants for you. And... Um, the, Richard just handed me a pot of this and he said, why don't you try this in your garden? I said, well, I don't believe it. <laughs> and I've been talking about it this week. And so I now have Dendrosor Dendrosoris littoralis. I think I'll keep it in a pot over this first winter and we'll uh, try and beef it up and get it a little bit bigger. And we'll plant it out next spring when all danger of frost is passed. But isn't that exciting? Oh, it is. Kind of wishing I hadn't gone last on the floral FOMO spot because that... <laughs> That was by far the most exciting. And I actually can't even remember the name of my much more mundane plant. But this is one I saw on Perennial Potties Instagram. And they shared from their nursery an agastache, or agastache, darling, as you may say. Agastache. 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 <laughs> I'm going to stick with agastache. Agastache Qudos ambrosia, a lovely cocktail of peach buds they say, that open to apricot flowers that turn pink as they age with grey-green foliage to soften the whole effect. Obviously, the bees love it, but I am a sucker for any kind of sunset shade combination. And these just are all of my favourite colours in one plant. And um, astonishingly, I don't have any agastache in my garden. So I think that's definitely gone right to the top of, uh, of my plant wish list, my ultimate floral FOMO at the moment. And you know well, what you'll you have to... Oh, go on, Al, go on. I'm sorry, I was just going to say, if you do get it, make sure you plant it in full sun in as light a soil as possible to, to help, it, help it come through the winter. And if you can't do that, I mean, take a few cuttings for good, as an insurance policy. It occurred to me, Thunder, when you were talking, there's, an also, there's also a multicoloured buddleia that might appeal to you, which is kind of orange and purple. Do you know it, Ian? I don't uh, know the name. No, I know, but I've, I've seen it about. I've seen it about. Yeah. And I mean, again, it's beloved by bees and butterflies. So, I mean, it fits the criteria of uh, being slightly, shall we say, show off it. <laughs> <laughs> it's like that nice hydrangea called Schloss Wackerbath. You know that one? Yeah. It's growing up in, it's growing up towards the church at East Ruston. You've got it. And it's the most wonderful mix of sort of 
oranges, you've got a bit of purple in there, lime green, a bit of red, and it sounds like it would be the most filthy thing, but actually it it's the like most bumps. wondrous. Yeah, but it's the most wondrous thing to see, isn't it? It's absolutely lovely. It really sloshes back a bath. It's just lovely. Yeah, I know you have a great memory for these funny names. And I mean, and there's huge, huge program of breeding different coloured hydrangeas today, especially on the continent. And we have them, I mean, we have the Magical Series and various other ones, but there's some weird colour combinations. But my favourite has to be the one that opens white, turns green, and then turns to a dark red. And that's one of the new ones that came from Holland in the last couple of years. Now, I absolutely love that because normally hydrangeas, they fade to sort of a rusty colour, but this one goes a really deep, proper shade of red. It's beautiful. Oh, be still my beating heart. <laughs> <laughs> what plants? What floral FOMO? I think we'll have to do this again. Um, now for the next section, um, I've upgraded. Last episode, I had a, a, the back of an envelope to write things on, but I found a notebook you gave me, Ian. So nice, I, good. I, and it's got bunnies and carrots on it, so it seemed apt for our podcast. Um, I had promised last episode that if people wanted to ask a question, then they could submit it in the comment section of the podcast and we would answer them. So let's go to people's questions. Phil said, can I be the first? Yes, you can, Phil. I need to move an Escalonia that's been in the ground for under a year. Is now a good time? I think we'd probably agree on this and I'd wait till September. Um, I think it's, if it's only been in the ground a year, it's not going to, its roots are not going to go on too far. Um, one or two points to mention, and the fact is that if, if, if the weather is dry, water it at least two days before you move it. When you move it, dig the planting hole, the new planting hole for it first. Um, and then when you dig it up, make sure that you get as much uh, soil with your root ball as you possibly can. The other thing I think to remember is the fact that when you get it into its new hole, you backfill the hole around the roots, but don't tread on it and jam it in, water it in. So give it a couple of watering cans, a couple of two gallon cans and puddle it in. And if, if, the, if the water overflows the hole, wait until it drains away and then add some more. Um, and then just keep an eye on it, keep it watered and it should be absolutely fine. Ian, what do you think? No, I think that's great. And September's a great time because there's still lots of warmth in the soil and plants will still be an active root growth as well. So it means that once it is moved, it'll get its roots into that surrounding soil just enough to take it over the winter. And then it'll put it even more roots down the following spring. And I mean, often there's never, um, you know, sometimes things have to be moved. For example, if a housework is being done or something but if you can leave things that optimum time between September and March I would say is a good time but not in the depths of winter that's a great window for moving most plants sort of shrubby things in particular to stop them getting too stressed so completely agree brilliant idea hope that's a good answer for you Phil mm -hmm. up next um, Alex would like to know what potting mix would you recommend for a dwarf cherry tree, which is in a large container? And also what drainage would you recommend for the bottom of that container? So I think it's a mix that particularly Al and I use a lot for, for, for plants and it's a 50-50 mix and it's a 50 mix of uh, a John Innes based compost. So it's a loam based compost. A uh, John Innes number three would be good for a cherry because they're quite hungry feeders. Mixed, the other 50% will be a multi-purpose compost. Now it could be peat based or it could be peat free depending on uh, how you garden. But that gives the organic matter and the John Innes gives the loam. Mix that all together. It's, it's, it's really good. It will put some weight in the pot as well because the cherries eventually, and that's a small one, it's going to get a crown on it. It will make sure the compost doesn't dry out too erratically and that's not a good thing for uh, anything producing a, a fruit so that will really sort of help stabilize the temperature um, and it'll hold on to nutrients really well as well and in the bottom of that pot I would either put a few crocs or if it's a nice big clay pot for example I'd put a croc over the drainage hole and then I'd put a layer of gravel in the bottom that works really well just to give a barrier to stop the bottom of the pot completely getting congested with roots and to allow excess water to drain away. Great tip. Uh, incidentally I was at the garden centre earlier and I um, for whatever reason, just spent a lot of time by the compost bags. And I realised that you can buy kind of multi-purpose that's got John Innes in it. Is that enough John Innes or do you kind of need to add more John Innes number three to it? 
It's a good base. I mean, it's a good thing to start off with, but I would always add more. There's not a great deal of dominance in there. I would say probably 10 to 20 percent. The reason they don't put huge amounts in is it's mainly because of haulage costs, really. Uh, but if you, if, you, if you don't want the hassle of buying two lots of compost, then yes, there are some good compost with added John Innes. Um, and they are really good at keeping your plants happy and healthy. But I would always try and add a little bit more just to bulk it up. But before we leave compost, because a lot of people might, if you don't, uh, get through the quantity of compost you guys get through and I was up at East Ruston the other day and those bag upon bag of multi-purpose that you have in your potting shed I mean it's, it's wonderful yeah. it's very exciting but most of us might get through sort of three quarters of a bag and then have that quarter yeah. sitting there in the potting shed how long is that going to be useful for and also how are you best to go about keeping it viable? Well, I think if you look at most compost bags, they say best used within six weeks. And I think perhaps that's because they want you to buy another one. I don't know. <laughs> but I mean, uh, I, I don't honestly know how, how long a bag of compost keeps because we, I don't keep it. I mean, it's continually being used. But I would think six months should, should be all right. What do you think, Ian? Yeah, I agree. I mean, I have used compost from clients' gardens that's been sitting there for up to a year. But what I have done is I've used that compost and I've ameliorated it with fresh compost to bulk yeah. it up and to use it as an additive or I've simply used it as a mulch on the garden just around a, a bed that I might be doing for example you will know if it's not right to use because what would have happened is it would have gone a bit like worm casts you know where the worm casts have that sort of almost clay like look to them and if the compost is no I good mean, it would have gone almost yeah it would have gone almost like that and then that's yeah. a sign that it's, it's think, probably no good to use on its own but would be fine mixed with other things one thing occurred to me when you when the question arose about um, Thordis mentioned the fact that you can buy compost, multipurpose, and John in his mix together, um, and you know if if that's what you want to do is fine. But if I was buying that and using that, I would add a couple of good handfuls. Well, more than that, I'd add shall we say a small bucketful to a wheelbarrow full of that of well rotted farmyard manure, oh, um, just to give you that little bit of extra. Uh, Oomph, if you like. Ba -ba the the <laughs> multiple compost that I use actually has slow release fertilizer already added to it. And you know, Ian, when one day when you asked me the cost of my compost and you balked at the cost of it, I'm not going to say how much it was. <laughs> yes, yes. You buy it wholesale and it was fiendishly expensive. And I was talking to Richard today and he said to me, What's this? And I said, Well, it's my multi purpose compost. Well, he said, Who's it made by? And I told him, and he said, Well, they're, 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 it's not like it used to be, you know. And I said, Nothing is, Richard. And he said, Well, I think I better get you some um, quotes on that, where to get something a little bit better. Ah. Um, but he did say that there's a generous amount of Osmocote, which is a, um, a slow release fertilizer. And he said, That is now fiendishly expensive. So that's what bulks the cost of it up. OK, so swings and roundabouts like anything, isn't it? But if you can save a bit oh. on the compost, that's good because, dear chap, you do use a lot of it. Yeah. We do quite a lot of videos on the Get Gardening channel about collecting seed, sowing seed. Uh, Norm asked, if a plant is producing seed, you know, at this time of year, in the autumn, isn't that when you should sow the seed? Why would you save it at all? Why would you save it and sow it in the spring? Which, you know, fair enough question. Who'd like to take that? Yeah, it, is. it is. Well, most seed you can sow, um, you know, as soon as it's ripe. Um, and some needs to be sown then because it's it, it's period that, that it keeps and it keeps viable is very short. So, I mean, there's if you if you go to somebody like Derry Watkins of Special Plants, she has a nursery down near Bath. She has a catalogue which is, is full of the most wonderful plants that you can grow from seed. And they are absolutely fascinating. And if anybody's new to gardening and they're experimental, I would urge them to get that catalogue because or look online because it's so, so worthwhile. But she has two uh, windows when she sends seed out. Out. She sends seed out in late summer, which you sow immediately, and you generally sow that immediately and leave it outside so it goes through a period of stratification through the winter where it gets cold and that um, helps with germination. Other seed that you don't need to stratify, you can sow in the spring. If you want to sow it in, in the um, autumn, the danger is that the seed will rot before it germinates. And I think it's done to help the gardener as much as anything. Um, I mean, if you let's take, a, take an instance foxgloves, they're all full of ripe seed now. If you scatter it on the ground, you won't see a seedling until the spring. But then they'll be they'll come up like mustard and cress, but not every plant will do that. And I think it's, it relates to the hardiness of the plant as well, because if you've got something like a half hardy annual, it's liable to die in the winter and the, and the seed is li likewise likely to die in the winter. And that's probably partly the reason. Final question then. How can I grow agapanthus, says Rob, 
as big as those in your Agapanthus video. And uh, there's at least one video on Agapanthus on the Get Gardening channel because you've got so many beautiful specimens, Addy Strust and Old Vicarage. But he's mm. right, you have some real stars of the show, some really beefy specimens. Well, I think the simple answer to that is a question of variety. Um, and, and Agapanthus is a vast, um, it's a, it's a huge, huge range of different varieties. As you know, when you saw six new varieties that I bought the other day in the garden, I'm, uh, we're just trialing to see whether they're gonna be any good or not. But I mean, one Agapanthus that comes to mind, which alas is not hardy, but it has, it's a tall, one of the tallest and, and some of the biggest heads is Purple Cloud, which is a very, really a very dark blue one. Um, if you want something um, that with the largest, largest heads of all, I think probably Queen Mum or White Heaven come to mind. Queen Mum is a bicoloured one. She has purpley blue tubes to the white flowers. Um, sometimes she's a little bit shy to start flowering. It's best grown in a container, a big one. Um, she's a little bit shy to start fl flowering when she's young. But once she gets into her stride, much like the good lady herself, she doesn't know when to stop. <laughs> white, white Heaven is interesting because each... Each flower, floret, on the big flower head has more petals. It's not quite double, but it looks fuller. It looks kind of plumptious. I think what Al, can, can I say? I think I think what Al said is what links in with what I've been thinking about Agapanthus, and it's they're all forms of um, Agapanthus that Alan's mentioned that have Africanus heritage in them. In yes. terms of Agapanthus Africanus, which is a large, robust, evergreen. Uh, Agapanthus from South Afri Africa and it does have large blooms on it and if you think about all the ones that Al's mentioned they all have that as part of their parentage and of course it means they're evergreen and it does mean they're slightly on the on the tender side some of them so you could get away with them on a south facing wall somewhere but Al grows some of his best Agapanthus in pots and of course what do we have in the bottom of our pots well well rotted farmyard manure a good mix of multi-purpose and John Ennis and slow release fertilizer and regular feeding and watering and one one thing Al's particularly good on is he never lets them get too pot bound you know he gets they get to a point where they fill the pot nicely and then he's like right we've got to split them we're going to do something with them and that's really important like a panthers because they do run out of steam they get to a point where they just have got too much root not enough compost around them and then the actual number of blooms will diminish dramatically so yeah it's possible choosing cultivars and good horticultural husbandry as well and if you want to ask a question about anything, well, you know, generally horticultural, you can go for relationship advice if you want. I'm sure not for Alan me, in particular not for me. would like to, um, to offer some advice in that quarter. But generally, anything planty, um, we will do our best to answer it. Pop your questions in the comment section on this video. And if that is beyond you, I did have several messages from people who said I'm locked out of my YouTube, so I can't subscribe, I can't like, I can't comment. Um, I will try and figure out a better way of you being able to submit a question uh, in the next video. But for the time being, I think we've run out of time. It's been good. Well, it's been lovely to see you all on a Sunday. I know. Bye, lovely people. See Love you ya. lots. Bye. -bye. Bye. So you're still, can you still hear us in? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> oh, you're so well lit, Alan. <laughs> I had this ready to talk about, my fabulous present. Oh, look at that. I know. Is it orange? Is it orange? Is it orange? I haven't opened it yet. I don't know. Is it orange or red? I don't know. They come in various colours. Go on, have a look. Have a look. Oh, that's orange! Yeah! <laughs> it's an orange one. Oh, winning at life, Thunder, winning at life. We kind of stopped recording, but we were still recording. This I wanted to talk about uh, and then forgot, but it was my birthday present from Herbert, Mr. Grey, and. Um, who would like to explain what this fabulous thing is? Well, it's a, it's a tying machine. It was invented for the nursery trade. Um, but the great thing about it is it uses this wonderful stretchy plastic tape to wrap around the stems of fragile plants. 
Um, and you know, it, this, it's, it's so good and so clever that it makes tying a pleasure. If you're tying in clematis or, or sweet peas, for instance, it's, it's just a dream job to do with that little, little machine. And it means that sometimes, uh, for instance, with sweet peas, uh, the perennial sweet pea, I've taken a great swathe of shoots and taken them across and clipped them to other shoots. And because the, the tape is so natural in greenish color that you don't see it but it's a lovely way and you can do the same with clematis you know sometimes clematis go up the wall and they don't stop they keep going and then a, a huge lump falls left or right and you can take it down and guide it in and do three or four ties with that to, to the other stems on the same plant or even a neighboring plant um, and it's just such a, it's a whiz. It saves time. You don't have to fiddle. You, you know, sometimes when you're tying with string, you really need three hands. And even <laughs> I haven't got three hands. <laughs> <laughs> this is just a dream thing. And I did mention it to you once. I said, I think earlier this year, I mentioned it to you and you said, oh, well, that's something I'll probably never have. And I suddenly thought the light bulb moment, birthday <laughs> present. And I thought, did she do that on purpose? I bet she did the minx. <laughs> Would I drop subtle hints did, like that? Of course you did. <laughs> and it's orange, and people may not know, but orange is my favourite colour. In fact, we should have told you, Ian, about the kind of orangey salmony memo. You could what? Have also, you could have matched. We're all matching apart from you. Oh, well, no one told me, I'm afraid. It's your fault, not mine. I'm just a guest anyway. It doesn't matter. I can go. <laughs> yes, it does. <laughs> yes, it does. Whether you like it or not, you're our brother in arms. Hey!